morning. Um, welcome and welcome back. I, I see some uh, some uh, returning faces from yesterday's uh, activities and uh, some new faces as well. Uh, my name is Sue Glover Takahashi. I'm uh, the director of education and research at Postgrad Medicine. And uh, uh, funnily enough, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Warren here, who, uh, who we work, work. It, it, you have to bring the outside expert yeah. Uh, yeah, or, so that uh, we gather. And uh, having been on phone meetings for the last two years, we didn't actually knew from each other just moments ago. So, welcome for facilitating uh, um, an opportunity for us uh, to explore some really, really important. Uh, uh, issues and opportunities in medical education. Uh, for those of you that uh, 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 weren't with us yesterday, uh, Dr. Ali Pankati took us through really um, some of his uh, both uh, vision and practical um, observations and solutions around, you know, uh, how to integrate uh, uh, the uh, best practices of competency-based education into really a workable framework uh, that is, uh, is, is really focused at uh, the core of uh, education in the workplace. Uh, Dr. Ali Tenkati is uh, uh, a renowned uh, medical educator. He comes to us uh, from Holland. And uh, I, I, I teach a couple of graduate courses and uh, and uh, what Ali doesn't know is that uh, you know his name is one of the ones that I tell my students watch this name, read what he writes, uh, <laughs> because uh, there are some uh, uh, some lead leading thinkers, and uh, I consider you to be one of those. <laughs> it's always funny when I say you know I'm a bit of a groupie. I really read everything <laughs> you write because uh, you know as medical educators we don't really think that way as as uh, part of our work. Uh, but uh, uh, this is. From my point of view, the self-determination theory is really, for me, a new direction of the sorts of thinking of integration of other areas of research in medical education. And uh, when we were planning the program in collaboration with the uh, um, Department of Surgery and Division of Orthopedic Surgery, who, uh, whose vision it was that we should bring Dr. Tenkati this spring, I said, you know, he's writing some really interesting new stuff. Let him. Uh, help us uh, understand how that fits uh, so we can uh, ride the wave of some of the new and important things. So welcome, uh, welcome back this morning and uh, we look forward uh, both uh, uh, to this talk and also for those of you that are staying on for the workshop. Um, I've asked um, our past uh, chair uh, of uh, the Department of Surgery under whom the competency-based curriculum was uh, innovated, Dr. Richard Resnick, to close the session this morning because I have to sneak out to the Board of Examiners, which runs from 8 till 10, and I will be back, but uh, Richard has agreed to help close uh, the, uh, the uh, meeting's proceedings. Uh, what I want to point out is that what we did yesterday was the meeting ends at 8, and those of you that need to leave because you have other parts of your lives to go to do, um, but what worked for us yesterday is that we we had a little bit of a staggered end and continued the questioning, um, the workshop itself for those of you that are staying on for that and others I know are coming is at nine o'clock down the hall. Alrighty, so thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, so when I was invited uh, to come to Toronto, I uh, was surprised to hear that uh, since I was there, people thought, well, why don't you talk about a different topic too, which is not really about competency-based uh, medical education. Uh, and, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it because it's, it's, uh, it's, on a th it's about a theory that, uh, that I came across actually, I would say about eight years or so ago, and I liked it very much at that time. Um, and uh, I would say about four years ago, I had an, a, a visitor from India um, Rashmi Kuzurkar, and she came up to me and said, I would uh, like to spend time at your department. Um, first she said, I don't have to be paid because I have a husband who moved to the Netherlands who has a good salary, and I, the only thing I want is a PhD in medical education. I want to do it at your place. So that was kind of, uh, kind, kind of nice if people are so determined uh, to do something, uh, what they want to do. Uh, so uh, I talked with her, and finally we, we had a solution to even have her paid position for a number of years 
So, and actually what she did, she uh, dug further into self-determination theory and motivation of medical students, and she just completed her PhD thesis uh, some weeks ago. Uh, so I would like to talk about this, and um, I actually suggest that this would be a very nice theory for her to work on further. And so I have to acknowledge her work also in, in what I will be talking about, Rashmi Kuzorka. She's now working at uh, Free University Medical Center in Amsterdam. But also we had uh, Jeff Williams from Rochester, uh, New York, who also collaborated in, this, in the paper that we wrote uh, in the, the Amy Guide on Self-Determination Theory. And it's just, uh, like Susan just said, a, a person that I never met in uh, face to face. But we work together over the phone and uh, by the email to complete this. And we'd be interested to once meet him. He is part of the group that actually um, around the psychologists who actually de developed this theory. So we were kind of pleased to have him in our team. Um, so to set the stage a little bit, uh, motivation uh, is an important element in, uh, in every, every day's life and also for medical students it's important. And there's several motivation theories uh, have been uh, developed over the decades. Um, and I won't go into those, all those, but uh, what we also noticed, and I think it's a publication that will uh, probably appear in academic medicine this month. Uh, it's also, first also with me, Rashmi Kuzorka, and what we did is we, we looked actually at what happened to medical education, particularly undergraduate medical education in the past decades. So what significant developments uh, were made and why were they made actually? So that was the main question. And we frame that question in psychology theory. And psychology is the learning, um, learning psychology says it's important uh, to look at, uh, uh, there's levels of, of learning and learning processes. One is the cognitive level, one is the affective level or motivational level, one is the uh, metacognition, metacognition level, or metacognition regulation level. Now if we look at why a curriculum have developed we found that most justifications for curriculum development come from the cognitive element. So people have been thinking, how can we uh, adapt education in a way that people will understand the content matter better? They can process information better. Uh, so we have, uh, so those actually are the, 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 the greatest forces to, to develop medic undergraduate medical education. Um, and we also wondered whether uh, motivational theories had an important impact on those developments. And what we actually found is we found little justification that motivation could help. And at the end of this morning, I would like to see if you I've had convinced you a little bit that, um, that it would be very important to particularly think of how can we motivate students. Uh, if you have very motivated students, pe people uh, they, they will do a lot by themselves and they, uh, you could have different ways, uh, routes to Rome is what we say sometimes. Um, so you could think of the best way to, um, to shape your education, but if you don't think of how it affects motivation, maybe you're missing something. So self-determination theory is a nice theory and I'll explain about it. Can you read that, Richard, from that side? Or I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, has received little attention yet uh, has, I think, uh, great potential. Um, Self-determination theory is actually a theory of human motivation, just general. It doesn't have to do with per medical education, not even education particularly. It has been applied to education, but it's just a general theory of mo human motivation. Uh, and actually it asks a question, of course, what drives people to do what they do? And the question here is how can we use insights from self-determination theory to understand processes in medical education? Um, evidence, particularly medical education, is very limited still, uh, but it's a nice lens through which you could look at medical education. Um, I will talk a little bit, I'll show you the faces of the founders of the self-determination theory. There's seven principles. If you look through self-determination theory, I, uh, if you read the literature, I kind of distilled the, the, the most important principles of self-determination theory. And then there's three psychological needs, and there's, there's one thing that I would like you to retain when you leave the room now, 
and just think of it a little bit, are those three psychological needs. If you can remember those, uh, you can think of those whenever you think of students and education, I think that would be wonderful. I'll also tell you a little bit about the spectrum of motivation types and then give some selected examples to view uh, medical education through this lens. Richard Ryan and Edward Deasy, this is Edward Deasy and Richard Ryan, from the University of Rochester is still very active and they actually build a huge um, bibliography of studies around self-determination theory. It started like in the early 70s, uh, particularly with uh, Edward Deasy, uh, but Richard Ryan has, has computed, contributed a lot to it and uh, now there's a whole network all over the world actually of psychologists who do studies in self-determination theory. There is uh, seven principles uh, as a, the way I look at that theory. And one very important principle is that what they say is uh, men is a human beings are growth oriented. So there is an innate tendency to grow. People want to build a unified sense of themselves, what they call, they want to grow and integrate in social structures. And it is a force that is actually uh, very natural. It happens to everyone. Um, and this tendency to do so uh, can be stimulated or it can be hampered. This is what the, where the outside world comes to, to affect what people do. Now there's three innate psychological needs that determine that ongoing growth. And that's a need for competence. What they maintain is that people want to be able to do things well. That is, that's their basic, there's one of their basic needs. Then there's a need for autonomy. People want to grow toward, towards positions that they can determine themselves what they do, what they, so they can actually shape their lives and shape their environment. And there's a need for relatedness. People grow into social structures, so they want to relate to other people in a way that they are reinforced in what they do, and they, they want to connect with other people. Um, now, what they say, the third principle is behavior is regulated, and it's regulated differently from different modes of motivation. Um, and I will show this later in a picture. I will elaborate further on it. But what they, at least, there's three groups of motivation that they determine, that they actually describe. One is um, a motivation actually is a state that people do things and they uh, cannot justify whatever they do. So. Uh, the A motivation is uh, people are directed by uh, just um, occasional forces at that moment, incidental forces. Ex in extrinsic motivation is people do uh, actually shape their behavior towards what uh, other outside forces that could be other people or uh, even internalized uh, voices of other people um, um, actually make them do things. An intrinsic motivation is when people uh, genuinely come with their, uh, their, their own feelings why they want to do things. So they just want to satisfy their, their personal, um, personal interest to do things. And all these uh, modes of motivation have different loads of causality. And this is what you see in this spectrum. So what I actually say, they, there's a spectrum of motivation. Uh, and that spectrum uh, is, you can map that out in behavior, in type of motivation, type of regulation, and the locus of causality. So the behavior is actually, uh, is on one side of that spectrum is not self-determined, and the other side is fully self-determined. Now, a, a motivation is a state that there is no regulation, it is actually impersonal, and people just do things because uh, something happens at that moment. Uh, I will not elaborate very much on it because this is, uh, this is, a, this is an, a very an interesting and most important part for, of that theory. So that is extrinsic motivation, it says that there's external forces that determine what people do. Now intrinsic motivation is fully determined by the self, uh, by intrinsic regulation and internal regulation. Now there's, you, you could see there's different stages of regulation, external regulation, introjected regulation, identified regulation integrated. Those are labels that are uh, given by um, uh, Lisi and Ryan on these 
uh, these elements. And they, what they do is they have <coughs> been able to distinguish these types of motivation with, with their, um, their instruments that they have developed and validated. So um, the external regulation level is actually fully de uh, externally determined so that people from outside actually say this is what you're supposed to be doing. I'll give you some examples later. This is somewhat external, this is actually somewhat more internal, and this is very much internal even if it's called in the group of extrinsic motivation. Now this sounds a little bit complex, but um, I, will, I will go into that further. <clears throat> so what they actually say that externally regulated behavior can become internally regulated. Now if you think of it, and uh, think of, for instance, children, how they grow up, um, their behavior is uh, for a lot part determined what their parents would say. To, they, they, their parents give them they ask them to do things and they would say, well, we don't expect you to do this, we want you to do that. And uh, so it actually, <coughs> it's external forces that determine their behavior. But after a while, you can imagine that these external forces actually become internalized. The, <coughs> the voices of the parents actually become the voices of their own mind. They, they start thinking uh, that I need to do this because I know that my parents will not approve of when I do this or that. <clears throat> so they, they kind of internally uh, regulate their own behavior even based on external forces. And um, you could even imagine that you would, uh, you would develop in a situation that you would even start believing that the external reasons to do things are your own choices. Because after a while you kind of forget that it's your parents that said you're supposed to be doing this. And this could be an explanation why there is cultural differences in different countries because uh, there is different ways to go about uh, in society. And so, um, <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's interesting to see that externally regulated behavior can become internally regulated, even though the, the theory would still say, Andy C. and Ryan <coughs> would still say, we don't call that intrinsic motivation, it's still extrinsic motivation, but internally regulated. Uh, <coughs> Now, stable intrinsic motivation requires the ongoing satisfaction of those three psychological needs. I will go into those three in the subsequent slides. Now, high intrinsic motivation and autonomous self-regulation is, and according to their research, associated with high levels of learning, of understanding, performance, and well-being. So they established in many studies that um, that if, if your level of intrinsic motivation, you could, if, if they, they, what they measure is, they measure both extrinsic and intrinsic motivation, they could have high intrinsic motivation and also extrinsic motivation. So it could be separate, separate elements. But high intrinsic motivation levels as measured uh, with their instruments and, and what they call autonomous self-regulation, I can show, this is, so this is, this part is actually autonomous self-regulation, is this column plus that column. Is, and um, that is associated with high levels of learning, understanding, performance, and well-being. So, uh, the, as I said, the, in, the extrinsic behavior regulation has shades of external, interjected, identified, and integrated. Um, and there is a combined dichotomy. So there is controlled self-regulation and autonomous self-regulation. And, and I'll come back to the, or actually I can show this slide here. Um, this, this is what they call Autonomous self-regulation is actually this part of the spectrum, and the left part of the spectrum is what they call controlled self-regulation. Uh, so it is still self-regulation, but it's externally controlled very much. Here's what they call autonomous self-regulation. Th these are labels, and it is a little bit, it sounds a little bit complex, but this is the way they can make differences when they measure motivation in, in, in people. Um, now these three needs, I think, if there's one thing, as I said, uh, I would like you to remember after this talk is those three needs um, that are so important for, um, for developing and sustaining intrinsic motivation. That is competence, what they, so people like to do what they're good at. Uh, so this motivates to go, get going. So if you think of, and maybe you can think of yourselves, um, usually we, 
uh, think of education a lot of, in the sense of uh, correcting people, hey, giving feedback because uh, some things they cannot do well. But if you think of yourselves, those things that you like to do is actually those things that you can do already uh, and you want to further develop that. That's what people actually want to do. So there is that, and we're coming back to that basic, very basic idea of growth. People want to grow um, and uh, they want to get fed into that direction of the things that they already can do well. Uh, so people like to be competent and like to develop their competence. Now autonomy is also something that people like to do things if they can determine by their own from a position of free choice. Uh, so that is what the people want to grow into that direction. Uh, so if you can um, establish that sense of autonomy, people will like what they do. So, and <clears throat> the third element is relatedness. Relatedness is um, being part of a group that actually uh, matters to you and that values what you're doing. Uh, that is a very powerful motive, uh, powerful stimulus for intrinsic motivation. So the combination of those three, and, and if in any way, in, in, in a setting, in a circumstances of, of education, you can, as educators, you can uh, shape education in a way that it serves those three needs for people. Uh, you have a high chances, what this theory says, to predict that intrinsic motivation will be developed well. Um, now, internalizing extrinsic motivation is what I already alluded to. Um, if you think of those stages of extrinsic motivation, you could think of, if, if you have an example of, ex, you want to an example of external regulation, think of abiding by a law or a rule only to avoid punishment. That is a, a, the, the very much an external uh, part of the, uh, the spectrum of, of motivation. So you would probably think of uh, the enforcement of laws in, in, um, in, in the traffic or so. You would not do things because you know you get a fine, even though you personally would think there is no, I could exceed the speed limit uh, on, on the road and there's no danger at all because it's Sunday morning, uh, like six o'clock or so, there's nobody there. But um, you would probably keep to that speed limit because you know you get a fine. Now the next, uh, so when, that motivation is interjected is actually you're accepting the rules and regulations of others even when rationally disagreeing. Well, here is actually, you, there's no way around it. Um, here is actually you're accepting the rules and regulations of others even when rationally disagree. Actually, this is even better example of what I just said about that uh, traffic uh, rule on Sunday morning. Uh, here you could even disagree with it. Uh, very much, uh, and you're just doing because uh, you know there, yeah, there's some rules that you would even not uh, agree at all with. Here's the third level, so uh, identification is like there's a sincere understanding of that rule. So you didn't invent that rule yourself, but you agree with it and fully accept the rules, even if they're set by others, because you understand it and you, you would really accept it. Now the fourth level actually is integration is that there is a full integration of that rules and regulations of others with your own <laughs> norms and values. Uh, and it actually leads to, a, to an internal conviction. And here's where people uh, start to kind of forget that they didn't, um, they didn't invent that rule themselves. So they will have their behavior regulated because of a, a very much internal conviction. It's interesting, when I talked with uh, Rashmi about this theory, uh, we kept discussing, for instance, how do you go about with your family? And in Western Europe, people have different relationships with their families than, for instance, in India, where she comes from. Um, you have, have a strong feeling that you need to care for your family, whereas in the Western countries, I mean, we have a lot of facilities for, for the elderly, and um, you don't need to take them in your own home, for instance, to care for them. Uh, but she says, well, in, in our country, uh, there, there's this very strong sense that uh, this is what you really want to do. Uh, there's no, it's not because you need to do it, but you want to do it. And the interesting thing is that I, I personally think that is a, it's a, a sort of integration of motivation to do that, uh, which is really integrated into your personality. Um, 
Some general findings from, uh, from self-determination uh, research is that the use of, it's an early finding in the 70s, that the use of extrinsic rewards like money or punishment uh, actually diminishes intrinsic motivation. And the reason before that is the reasons for action shift. Um, and I can give you an example from education, for instance. If you have um, small group teaching for, for medical students, for instance, um, you can see that. But what happens if you say to students, we, we do this and we can justify it because it's, you learn a lot from it, discussing with your colleagues, uh, with your peers in that group, and we we'll work on problems and problem-based learning. And we have, for instance, there's 10 sessions and then somebody starts saying, well, I can't be there this session number five or so. You'd say, well, if you really can't be there, there must be a good reason for it, maybe not. And then other people start thinking, uh, could, ha do I have to be there all the time? And then you start uh, um, thinking of a rule. Maybe you should say, I want you to be there for 80% of all sessions. And if you don't get it, we, we won't, uh, we won't um, have you pass the course. Um, so now suddenly there's a shift coming up. So people would think, um, um, yeah. why I can skip one session or I can skip two sessions, but not more than that. Which sh skip, uh, session will I skip because there's other things that I would like to do? Um, and you understand that in the minds of the people, the, some external regulations start coming up. Uh, whereas actually the whole idea of that education is actually meant to be uh, to to have them intrinsically motivated for, for that teaching. So there's an external force coming up. And what actually self-determination theory says, when you start giving ex extrinsic rewards or punishments, um, the intrinsic motivation usually drops. Um, so um, what they generally find is autonomously motivated learners, so on the right side of the spectrum, um, thrive and and uh, students benefit academically when teachers support their autonomy. Um, so uh, what they call uh, autonomy supportive uh, teaching behavior would stimulate intrinsic motivation. Uh, and if you think of the types of behaviors, uh, so we have, if you compare controlling teaching behavior with autonomy supportive teaching behavior, this is like following instructional materials or giving directives and commands and thinking using statements to take control over situations or, or providing solutions for problems. Whereas autonomy supportive teaching behavior would be rather listening to and acknowledging students' perspectives, um, giving time and opportunity to do work autonomously, uh, to praise quality of performance and providing constructive and uh, effective feedback, um, to keep inquiring what students actually would want and being empathic uh, with students and actually thinking from their perspectives and see if, how can uh, you uh, shape the environment for students that they actually can be autonomous in the way they, uh, uh, they study. Um, there's uh, many fields, it's not only education but many other fields, the self-determination has been applied and one of the fields is uh, also in, in medical therapy, um, so specifically in the more psychological side. So there is evidence that uh, alcohol treatment programs uh, benefit from, from autonomy supportive approaches to patients and weight loss programs, adherence to medication programs and smoking cessation programs. Uh, there is literature and uh, specifically uh, Jeff Williams, so the third author of our paper has done many studies in that field. Now if you think of uh, Looking at medical education through the lens of self-determination theory, there's a number of things that I could, would like to talk about just briefly. Uh, so uh, on curriculum effects, on selection effects, assessment, um, clinical responsibilities, in the wording of feedback, in offering electives, uh, using students as teachers and researchers, and also something about teacher motivation. So just quickly run through it and I would like to start with a, with a, sort of a general statement and um, I think it's um, it's a little bit of a provocative statement but I like it actually that is if you think of um, think of that first principle of that self-determination theory that actually people have an autonomous tendency to grow um, it's also to grow in whatever direction they would want to grow so 
There is a, within self-determination theory, you don't have to remember this, but there is some, there is many theories, and there is one many theory, it's called the Arga, uh, organismic integration mini theory, that predicts that um, the, the three need satisfaction forces will make individual overcome hurdles to become self-determined. So um, hurdles um, are all th uh, things that they have to, uh, or conditions that they have to meet to, to, to develop. Um, and the, the, there is a power in themselves actually, if, if people really want to become a doctor, um, you, you would imagine that uh, there's uh, also there's different ways to roam. If you could go to this school, you could go to that school. And, and, and we have been thinking as medical educators how we can best make our curricula. But curricula over the world are very, very different. And uh, so my, uh, my statement would be that uh, a very determined um, student will become a doctor no matter what route they take. Uh, so they, they just uh, try to meet the conditions. Uh, so there's many, many ways that you could go to Rome. Uh, so actually most medical students actually are highly motivated. We're very um, pleased that our population is so motivated and, and I'm, I'm sure that's in Canada the same thing. If you look at all the tertiary um, uh, students, the medical students are very highly motivated. Um, and high motivation makes actually they, they want to adapt to whatever circumstances require whatever study effort is asked. Uh, they will just adapt to that because they know they want to become that doctor. Uh, so there's great difference between curricula, but actually they may yield just as competent doctors. And the interesting thing is much of the variance of outcomes of education may be determined by motiv motivational power. Uh, it's interesting that we have been thinking much of, uh, in, in educational research, much of um, sort of cause-effect type of, of research that we think if we give this intervention, uh, we'll look at the outcome of students. Um, but we actually more or less disregard uh, the, the great power that the students have themselves. Uh, so if they want to get somewhere, uh, they will get that place. And no matter what type of education they go through. So actually, um, um, I think that power actually explains much of um, I would say maybe even disappointing type of uh, educational research that shows that different ways of edu uh, methods of education uh, are, uh, don't show much difference in effects. And I think what happens actually is, uh, is, is what the variable that we didn't count with this is a strong motivation of students. Um, now, selection for medical school is another example. So passing a selection hurdle may give candidates a feeling of competence. Uh, so if they really pass that, a uh, feeling of relatedness, now I belong to this group. Uh, and if you think of it, um, I've been uh, looking into some literature just lately about selection procedures. It's, it's a big topic in the Netherlands now because they are changing our system. And what I tend to find is that um, the criteria that are used for selection procedures have a very low predictive power. And, uh, but the fact that people go through a selection procedure is probably a more important power. Uh, there is an interesting Danish study actually has been done that shows that, um, that the fact that people go through a selection procedure um, actually protects them from leaving medical school. Um, so, and, and what I actually believe here is what happens is people have gone through this and have gotten feedback because they have been selected, which actually kind of psychologically boosts their, their feeling of competence because they think they can do it. And also their feeling of, it could be a relatedness though, because uh, if the selection procedure ends up with the feeling that I would like this school and the people in the school like to have me, uh, that actually boosts your feeling of relatedness to that. And I think that type of culture is being cultured also in, in North America very much, that the sense of uh, sort of corporate identity that people like to develop being part of that school. Uh, so that actually boosts that relationship, uh, relatedness actually element. Um, so um, 
examinations. Uh, collective assessment typically do not stimulate autonomy. So if you uh, have people do exactly the same thing in, gr in large groups of students. Uh, so uh, if you would want to stimulate autonomy, uh, and maybe the, the competency-based approaches that we uh, are thinking of in postgraduate training <coughs> would also more lead to the idea that people can determine their own pace and re the reaching of their competence. So they're not <coughs> part of the large group that, that has to do exactly the same thing as other students, but uh, you, you, have <coughs> you give to people much more feeling of, of control of their own life if they can, if they can take the path that they choose to, to, to take. Or, and the idea of competency-based education, we've been talking about more flexible uh, approach than the time-based approach. And, and I think that has to do with, uh, uh, all, that also could affect um, intrinsic motivation of people. Maybe in computer-based testing, we might create, well, I'm not sure about this, but it, it might be possible to create much more individualized uh, approaches to education if you can use IT facilities to have a more competency-based approach also in, um, in, in undergraduate education. <coughs> Now the, the, the feedback wording, uh, we use, do a lot of feedback in, in medical uh, training. Um, and if you would uh, shift from, uh, uh, shifting from the individual context to manipulate the feeling of competency in sense of you are, uh, so if, um, <clears throat> let me see, if you, if you put the locus of causality different uh, when you provide feedback to persons, uh, you could make a difference between either saying you are failing or uh, this case is hard to master. So that's very subtle difference in wording, uh, but you may influence how people actually uh, experience the way um, they, they go about with assigning. So if you say this, is, this case is hard, hard to master, you kind of accept that students uh, grow into that direction that they will be able to master it. Uh, so if you shift from instruction to self-regulation to support autonomy, so not, oh, excuse me, uh, not let me tell me what, uh, what to do versus tell me how you think you want to do this and ask me anything you want. So if you, uh, that's a different, different approach. Um, so if you, you would, if you want to stimulate autonomy in people, um, you could say, I would want you to do this, or you could say, uh, you could have a dialogue actually with the person and, and say, can you uh, tell me how you would like to, uh, how you would want to do this and ask me uh, for help if you need me. Um, so pull, pulling students into the professional community to stimulate feelings of relatedness. Uh, so you have different ways to, to formulate that. Uh, one is you would not understand how we do this. Eh? So if a student just come on the wards the first time uh, and um, you would can kind of invade the, convey the, the message that the student is not part of your group because they're, they're newcomers or so you'd say you would probably not understand this. It would be different than if you would say we had uh, we all had, do you accept what to understand their feelings? Do we all have difficulty to master this? And you will get there too. So that's a different way to actually, um, to, to have people become part of your community. Um, so electives in education, uh, we can think of electives and we've seen that in my school, we have increased the number, the elective parts of, of our program in the, in the past few years uh, greatly. Um, and electives can create student autonomy because then they can determine themselves much more what they can do. That's different from, um, from a one-size-fits-all type of curriculum that everybody does exactly the same. And if they take an elective and do some in-depth study in a selective field, they may uh, get feelings of competence in comparison with other, other students. Also clinical responsibilities. Uh, if we have students in clerkship uh, to what has been called legitimate, 
legitimately participate in healthcare, even be it peripheral. Um, and that's a theory from, from community of practice of Leben uh, and Wenger. Uh, people uh, can get their get the feelings of competence and, and autonomy and relatedness that may be boosted. Uh, and um, in, in my school, we're thinking of restructuring clinical education in a way that we uh, start giving more responsibilities to students, even if they are on small areas. And we would probably want to start using EPA, the APA concept in undergraduate education. And if you do that, um, you actually uh, have people actually bring people in positions that they are really seriously uh, taken seriously in, in healthcare. So being formally acknowledged to carry out an EPA, even if it's on a small field, may generate this feeling of, uh, of competence and autonomy and also relatedness if, if you're really taking somebody seriously as part of your uh, a junior colleague. Um, what we also do, and I will talk about that uh, later this morning, uh, have students use as teachers. We have senior students do a lot of teaching uh, in our school. And they can do that. And the interesting thing, I, I uh, uh, conduct uh, a ro actually a teaching rotation, uh, director of a teaching rotation. and. My, uh, the students that I talk with, they, they suddenly um, discover uh, that, they can, that they have mastered much more knowledge than they ever actually realized they had um, after six years of medical school. Uh, they're not, at that moment, uh, even in the sixth year, they're not the, the junior uh, who is learning and who is taking examinations, but in putting them in the position of a teacher actually boosts their, their motivation a lot. So being a near peer teacher for junior students generates those feelings of competence and autonomy. And maybe also relatedness, because if they get back that, the feelings from the junior students, they may feel that way. And students publishing in scientific journals also happens. We stimulate students to do that uh, in undergraduate uh, education. So the Dutch students, we calculate actually 15% of the Dutch medical students publish at least one uh, a journal article before graduation. Um, and it's also, it's actually academically growing into more responsible positions uh, in teaching and research. And, and we believe that uh, boosts their motivation too. Another topic would be uh, looking at teachers uh, from self-determination theory perspective. Um, so what we have been uh, doing actually in, in, in many countries in modern medical education is that um, education is much more regulated uh, centrally than it used to be in the, in the past. Uh, so we have um, highly integrated, coordinated units, pro uh, partly problem-based, um, but it also has a risk in it and that it's, uh, it's good for students. It's very much student-centered to do this, but teachers um, must abide by all these rules, uh, actually these educational formats that we, we have designed, which actually gives them less autonomy to determine their content than the method of teaching that they would have like 20 or 30 years ago in those modern medical curricula. Um, and also some less possibility to apply their personal expertise. And uh, we actually now are kind of rethinking how we can um, reinstall better motivation in, in teachers, in, in my school at least, and, and how we can both kind of reconcile what we want for students and also what we, how we can retain that high level of motivation in teachers too. So um, we, I did actually a large survey um, a year and a half ago among um, teachers in, uh, in, in my school and um, we had about 300 teachers answering uh, questions on what elements of teaching would motivate you uh, most. And this is actually from a list of 22. These are the top, um, the top elements. And if you look at it, um, teaching my, my own specialty is actually uh, something that relates to competence or noticeable appreciation for teaching from my direct supervisor is, has to do with relatedness. Many teachers do that and don't get anything back from their personal environment. Um, here's the freedom to determine what I teach. 
that's autonomy. The freedom to determine how I teach is also autonomy. Uh, the noticeable appreciation by teaching my immediate colleagues too is a relatedness. So those elements actually, we, um, we, we kind of found that uh, um, if you ask teachers how, when they are, how they could be motivated better, uh, it has, you, you can understand those things from self-determination theory. So in conclusion, I think the, um, it is a, it's a nice theory uh, to, to have in, in, in the back of your mind when you look at education, when things go good or when things go, go wrong and see how, can, uh, how can you fix things uh, from that theory perspective. Um, so the effects of autonomy supported teaching in a curriculum structure have not been studied yet enough, I think. Um, and, but it appears promising. I think we should do more studies in the future. That was actually uh, my talk on self-determination theory.